Laura Rosenberg, the Associate Chair for Education and the host for today's Grand Round session. Um, just a few things to get us started by way of um, housekeeping. First, I'd be remiss if I didn't share uh, the today's presentation. I'm actually really excited about it. It's going to be an innovative, impactful, and really exemplary model that we're going to hear about today. Uh, it's entitled Integrating Culture, Science, and Advocacy, 15 Years of Cultural Adaptation Research with Latinx Populations. And I'll introduce our, our esteemed speaker in just a moment. But before we do that, a few housekeeping items, as you probably know. Uh, your mics and cameras are turned off with the exception of presenters and interpreters. Uh, we would invite you, please, to share your thoughts, feedback, questions using the Q&A box, uh, which is featured at the bottom of your screen. And those of us up here on the panel will use the chat box uh, for interpreters and technical issues. I will ask your questions of the speaker during the Q&A portion at the end of the session, so please do share those as they come up and we'll moderate some discussion at the end. There are a few ways that we would like to solicit your feedback, and that feedback really is important uh, to me and to our committee and to our speaker, but also uh, helpful in the service of you getting continued education credit uh, using that evaluation form. The first is that we'll post a link to the uh, form in the chat. There'll also be a link at the end of the presentation and um, to the email address with which you registered for the session. We'll send out a link that way as well in the next day or so. I think that's it for housekeeping. Uh, so without any further delay, it is absolutely my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Ruben Para Cardona. Um, who is uh, not only uh, esteemed for many reasons, but also a colleague of mine, an associate professor at the Steve Hicks School of Social Work and area director of research at the University of Texas Austin Latino Research Institute. He was funded by NIMH to investigate the treatment efficacy um, and relevance of two versions of an evidence-based parenting intervention culturally adapted for Latino families with young children. He's currently funded by NIDA to extend this line of research to Latino families with adolescent children. He served as vice president of the Family Process Institute and is an editorial board member of Family Process. He's also a member of the board of directors of the Society for Prevention Research. He has extensive experience on research collaborations across the U.S.-Mexico border, and currently he's a co-principal investigator of a large-scale parenting prevention initiative in Chile, funded by a large private foundation and the Chilean government. Uh, without further ado, uh, I am very pleased to hand it over to you uh, and to welcome all of you to our Grand Rounds. Thank you so much uh, for the introduction. And thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today. I feel very honored. Um, I congratulate you for all the successes that you have achieved. I have been able to look at your website and uh, looking at the very exciting um, things that you are achieving. And for that very same reason, um, it's truly an honor to be here today with you to share our story. Basically, I would like to share our story. We are living turbulent times. Uh, you have been reading the challenging news here down in Texas, and we keep moving forward in this dream for social justice. And as part of that, I will tell you the story of cultural adaptation of evidence-based parenting interventions. It's been a journey for me, not only a scientific journey, but also a personal journey, a journey to pursue a dream. And that's what I'm uh, deeply excited about this and being with all of you and very grateful to everyone who has organized this space. I have my deepest gratitude all the way from planning, logistics, um, and to all of you for uh, devoting this time of this day to me. Okay, so it, yeah, it's been 15 years. When I think about it, um, it's like, gosh, time really flies. And I would not be here without the people who have made this possible. I'm the speaker today for many people, uh, community partners, the Latino parents themselves who have taught us so much. And by the way, in the Q&A, if we have time, you will see that I interchange the terminology of Latinx and Latino for several reasons. I do a lot of work in Latin America. So that's my reason for that, but I can go on that uh, at a later time. Also investigators, mentors, research staff, grad students, everyone who has been involved in this journey. And you can see the faces of community members, but also the project managers who, you know, principal investigators are important, but really the heart and soul of many of these projects are those project managers do day and day keep them moving. 
Um, we feel very grateful for 15 consecutive years. We have received funding from the National Institute of Health. The original funding um, was received from the National Institute of Mental Health. And after that, uh, NIDA has been consistently funding our work and we feel very grateful for this support. So um, the, the, the first part of my presentation, I will center this in the area where we truly develop um, cultural adaptation research or regional study, and that's in the city of Detroit. I, I love this picture because uh, when I um, entered this community, uh, they were in bankruptcy. And uh, you would see in the, in, here in the news, the many horror stories about the city collapsing. And it was very impactful to drive through the city and see those abandoned buildings. So that's what you see in the background. But also the, the stories of discrimination towards Latino immigrants were very daunting. But I love this picture because it shows in the forefront the spirit of the people of Detroit. And that's what is important. Uh, anytime we're facing challenges, including now during COVID, um, I just have seen the, the spirit, the fighting spirit of Latino people come through in very beautiful ways. In today's journey, I will talk about this, this dream that we pursue, integrated science, integrated social justice, and integrated culture. Sometimes we advance in the side of culture and then we overlook the science. Sometimes we do great strides on the science and then we overlook the social justice. So it's a very delicate balance that we always try to achieve. Why Latino populations? Well, uh, first, it's very personal. I'm Latino, uh, born and raised in Mexico. I came to pursue um, my education here in the United States where I met amazing people in my journey. And, uh, but also I, I, I face several of the challenges with in, in, in an, an immigrant. Uh, the US immigration system is a very challenging system to navigate, it can be very discriminatory. It took us 15 years to become US citizens, 15 years of a battle, uphill battle, but we finally achieved the dream. And as an immigrant, we pursue the dream of giving our families a better future, just like the families we work with. We work with uh, low-income Latino and Latina immigrants who devote their lives to this country. When we look at our roofs, our landscaping, our vegetables in the store, meat, um, restaurant industry, hotel industry, everywhere we see Latinos. And all those Latinos are pursuing a dream, a dream of uh, offering a better future to their families. But unfortunately here, the story um, that we have found and particularly underserved Latinos have found is that despite of all these benefits and contribution to the US society, they keep receiving these messages that they are the outcasts, the, the ones who are not desired. We run parenting groups in our program. That's our method of delivery. And before we start a group, we process the experience of being an immigrant. And the most difficult question that we just need to hold, we don't have answers, uh, is when parents say, Ruben, we do so many things for, your, for, for the people of the United States. We make sure they have the houses they want, they, they look beautiful, the food that they need, but we are hated. Why are we hated so bad? Why, why do they hate us so much? And those are the type of the questions that you just need to sit with and just let the pain be. And ask yourself, what's my role in this reality in terms of making and offering a better contribution to them? So that has that conversation needs to be informed and our program of research is informed by this very challenging relationship of the United States. The United States, I'm very proud to be finally a citizen of the United States, and I would do it all over again. The, the growth, the inspiration, the beautiful things completely have all, uh, surpassed all the challenges. But it's very important to have a clear perspective about the history of the United States. And when we look at history, we see the history of imperialism, right? In this map, this map, I took a picture of this all the way when I came as an exchange student when I was 18 years of age. And this was a lecture in high school of how the United States-Mexico War was presented to students. And the teacher was very benevolent in describing that history and saying, well, in 1845, 
Uh, this territory was annexed from Mexico because Mexico had a lot of turmoil and this territory was ceded by Mexico and then turned the page. That's not the reality. That's not the reality we have faced in Latin America. In Latin America, we have experienced an uh, uh, imperialism in many ways. Yes, there are many challenges that need to be addressed in Latin America, like uh, widespread corruption that uh, become fertile ground for these imperialistic practices, but is a bi-directional relationship. So our program of research is informed by this knowledge because we cannot implement this work without uh, uh, overlooking that history. And the history of the United States, a nation found, uh, founded on slavery and the use of people of color. What you see on the bottom right and top right are not uh, pictures from Nazi Germany, are pictures from the US Department of State actively recruiting Mexicans during World War II because the country was collapsing. So with the Bracero program, there was a large initiative set in motion in order to, to prevent the country from collapsing. And that was the massive hiring of Latino immigrants in many areas of productivity uh, that were needed for the country and that were at risk of collapsing. So in that journey, um, uh, with, that, with that background, let me turn down now to, to my journey in parenting. I completed my internship, my doctoral internship in the juvenile justice system, providing therapy to adolescents and their families. And, and something that we would see over and over and over was that we would release them from uh, treatment uh, after individual treatment as adolescents, and we would have them back within six months. And that's when I realized that uh, impacting the family system was essential and impacting the family systems through parenting practices, because one of the common threads that we observed was that uh, parenting practices, ineffective parenting practices or neglectful or abusive parenting practices were at the core of a lot of the youth maladjustment. And um, I know that we have a combination here of researchers, clinicians, faculty, and that's where I think my identity as a clinician, as a, a group facilitator, but also as a researcher, I started to come together in terms of, okay, what can I do to offer uh, to our people when we're seeing this reality? So um, based on the history I share with you about the, you know, the tumultuous history between the United States and Mexico, I was not fond of the idea of culture adapting an intervention that was originally developed with a majority of US uh, of uh, Euro American uh, appearance. I was not that fun because I said, what we need is a Latino center intervention. But at that time, uh, parenting interventions were virtually evidence based parenting interventions were virtually non existent. And, uh, you know, as a scientist, I was pursuing that models for that. Um, it wasn't an NIMH funded conference, beautiful conference that NIMH funded for 10 years in which they would integrate parenting researchers that I, for the first, first time, heard um, talk um, Jerry Patterson and Marion Forgatch from the Oregon Social Learning Centers. You see their pictures here and the developers of Generation PMTO. And these researchers had perfected for years uh, observational research to integrate an evidence parenting uh, program um, that would be directly to the parents with a mediated effect. That means by impacting the parenting practices, it would have a, a trickle down effect on uh, adolescent adjustment. Uh, what you see here is the implementation of the first randomized controlled trial with 500 families. Half of those families were allocated to what the intervention that they titled Generation PMTO, half uh, were allocated to wait list control. And what is so impressive is that NIMH not only funded the randomized controlled trial, this study lasted five years, so it came all the way to here, but what is super impressive is that they continued funding to see the long-term effects. It's, it's one of the most mind-blowing um, studies in the parenting field because it's not only including the efficacy and some of the effectiveness, but also the long-term effects. And what you see here is truly impactful. What you see here is that the parents allocated to wait list control 
had way more, those adolescents in those families were way more at risk of becoming involved with the juvenile justice system over time compared to the ones who were not. So these families had children between the ages of five and 12, and they were tracked for nine years. So here we see them at 14, 21 years of age, and we see the impact of parenting practices over time. So when parenting practices are absent, are inconsistent, are neglectful, we see the high risk for uh, youth maladaptive behaviors compared to the ones where parent practices were consistent. And at that point, despite my anger and frustration with the history of the Mexico-US um, very tumultuous relationship, I realized we had to test this for our families to give this a try with our populations. So why cultural adaptation, as I mentioned to you, because I work in the juvenile justice system, I saw that parenting practices, deficient parenting practices were at the core of us having to work with youth in that system. Now, because uh, the big conundrum was how to transport an intervention that was originally adapted for your American populations to Latino populations without engaging in imperialistic practices, because even though I am a Latino, I was already affiliated with a, a US institution, and I had to be very careful about replicating that history of imperialism, right? So uh, the, the way we proceeded with that was pretty much informed by my identity as a clinician. Uh, when you start a, a, a clinical process with a patient, with a family, you don't uh, start prescribing, you start understanding. And based on that understanding, then you move forward. So that's why we set in motion a two year qualitative study in the city of Detroit to understand from the life experiences of Latino parents in Michigan. We wanted to understand the life experiences of immigrants, but also as parents. And that study was very fruitful. We have publications resulting from that work. And the major themes that we learned were about the experiences of adverse and discrimination, parenting challenges, and parenting needs. Now, I will not go in depth because of the sake of time, but I um, can tell you that this study was in incredibly important because we adapted everything according to the voices of participants. So we maintain the essence of the core components of the parenting intervention that we were adapting, uh, Generation PMTO, but we also kept the essence of the voices of people. For example, when we asked participants, can you describe discrimination to us? One father expressed, discrimination is a better drink that you need to swallow. You have to swallow it because you say, if I get rebellious or do not behave, they can throw me into jail or they won't help me. So you just have to swallow that drink. This is very important because Many times I see uh, some colleagues working with underserved Latinos, particularly under a lot of uh, oppression, that they want to make things better as they are doing the interventions. They want to over, overlay on, a, on, on narratives of hope when the reality is many things are not working right and many things have um, uh, deeply hurt Latinos and their families. And, and we have a broken immigration system. And even though current policies are more benign, are not as aggressive as the previous administration, undocumented immigrants are always at risk. So you're running a group and you say, oh, don't worry, everything is gonna be okay. Well, no, not everything is gonna be okay. And, and you just need to acknowledge those realities and not over promise. So we focus on the parenting, we focus on the cope that comes from parenting, but we are always very measured in terms of how we address contextual adversity because it's very real and continues to be real in our state and our country. At the same time, it's very important to embrace those strengths that uh, were uh, described by parents. And, all, and one of those is the value of Latino cultural values. Uh, here in Austin, uh, very, very tough heat in the summer, 110 degrees. And uh, you drive around and you see the crews working on roof replacements, all Latinos, and they have the music and they're singing and they're joyful in the midst of that horrible summer. And a lot of that has to be with the resilience of spirit of immigrants 
and also the cultural values. Latino values is to steal in your children to be respectful of others. It goes in the blood what your parents teach you. So um, that's what we learn in terms of adapting the intervention. So we move then generation PMTO and an intervention originally developed for a majority of uh, your American parents. How do we transport that to Latino populations? And that's uh, when we move to the process of cultural adaptation. Now, NIMH funded us not to adapt an intervention only for Latinos. But NIMH funded us to demonstrate the importance of cultural adaptation. So they put that challenge out there for us. And, the, and what we proposed to them was an innovative research design that it has not been, um, uh, these designs are very scarce. I haven't seen many of these designs in the literature. And in the parenting literature, I believe we were the first ones to propose something like this. And basically what we proposed was to conduct a uh, uh, a surface level cultural adaptation and surface level, I mean, we didn't alter in depth any core components of the original intervention. It was a very good adaptation in terms of language, in terms of the visual images and, and, and everything we use uh, in Latino interventionists, but it was not in depth. In depth intervention was the CAPAS enhanced intervention. In that intervention, we had a culture in context text focus sessions. And as uh, throughout the sessions, we um, infuse uh, uh, the knowledge of context and culture according to the Latino values and experiences that participants communicated to us. So for example, in this intervention before the setting limit session, we would have a conversation with parents about how they were discriminated uh, against uh, at work. They would say, well, we woke up at five in the morning and then they would call me wet back and then the employer didn't give me a break. And then at the end of the day, instead of paying seven hours, uh, uh, they would pay me, uh, instead of paying me 10 hours that I worked, they would pay me six and they would say, well, what do you want? Do you want us to call immigration on you or what do you want? So at that moment, parents, uh, we're able to reflect about the stressors of the day, the discrimination of the day, before we actually engage in those uh, parenting components. So as you can see, this intervention has uh, Latino uh, uh, and culture focused themes, as well as oppression and uh, themes related to oppression throughout the intervention. So this is what is called um, uh, an in-depth cultural adaptation compared to a surface level adaptation. And uh, it, was, it was the premise of our uh, major research hypothesis. Would there be a difference between these two? And we had a third condition, a wait list control group that we would have, uh, they would have the intervention uh, when we completed all the measurements. So this is the, the, the core of our findings. Uh, what you see, uh, on the left side is the slide that presents the parenting practices. And, and what you see there is that both interventions groups, um, the, the surface level, the CAPAS and the CAPAS enhanced, improve their parenting process, practices com compared to control. So that tells us that uh, just by being in the intervention, uh, parents in both groups improve on their parenting practices. And that was a very good uh, result. Uh, it says that even if you cannot go in so much depth about the cultural adaptation, parents are gonna benefit. But the findings are most important and the findings for which our work has been known in the international context, all the way all to South Africa, where folks are adapting according to differential designs, is this. Uh, this is the slope of child internalizing and externalizing behaviors, depression, anxiety, antisocial behavior, oppositional behaviors. And what you see here, the, parents, the, the children in families exposed to CAPAS and HANS significantly improve on their internalizing and externalizing behaviors. That is very important because when we go back to this uh, description of the intervention, here we would deliver every parenting component by framing the component according to the dynamics 
and realities of oppression that families were experiencing. We would do that in a focused way. Let's talk about what it's like to be an immigrant, but also let's talk about the ways in which your parenting is impacted by daily contextual stressors as an immigrant. When we went back to the qualitative data of, of this slope, parents started disclosing to us, okay, now I get it. Uh, you know, I, I go to work, I'm discriminated against, I'm offered two bathroom breaks instead of four that my colleagues are offered. Um, I get paid six hours instead of 10 and I'm threatened to be uh, thrown to immigration authorities and I just suck it all up. I, I take all that frustration because I cannot fight back, I'm undocumented. But I get back home and I realize I have power, I have power over my children. And then without, without me knowing it, I'm already overpowering them through the parenting practices. So it, the, the core of this finding is that it's not only parents learn parenting practices that they didn't have when they become parents, um, you know, none of us know how to be a parent. We really need to learn how to be a parent. But on top of that, the dynamics of oppression and discrimination deeply impacted their parenting experiences. That's why our latest publication is titled um, uh, The Need to Overly Address Discrimination in Evidence-Based Parenting Interventions. Because as mental health providers, one of the challenges we face we apply all these adapted interventions that are efficacious, um, mindfulness, CDT, parenting, et cetera. But if we overlook the context in which our patients, families, uh, participants of interventions are living, if we overlook that, then that perpetuates oppression. Um, so uh, that, that has been one of the most, uh, important contributions we have offered to the field because rather than saying a rhetoric about this, we provided hard empirical data showing that it truly makes a difference when you overtly address discrimination and oppression compared to when you do not do that. So uh, in terms of the qualitative narratives, we have narratives in which parents who had not been uh, exposed to parenting programs, expressed beautiful things. These parents were engaged in very harsh parenting before. And then the way they reflect that intervention, they would express things like, I learned that I was the one who had to change rather than expecting my child to change. This is huge because in therapy, I would always get stuck in terms of what is it that you're doing wrong? And then parents would get reactive and defensive and, but you know, the beauty of this parenting program is that uh, therapists are uh, supervised. So they talk about 25% of the time and they engage in role plays and other very didactic skills 75% of the time. So rather than talking about, are you doing good parenting? We engage parents in role plays. And then when it's their turn to be parents, they see some of the challenges they have. So that's where this uh, comment comes from. I learned that I was the one who had to change rather than expecting my child to change. Very profound insight. Um, I always had problems with my daughter doing her homework from giving 25 orders at one. Now the incentive chart, it's only five steps. I am, we use incentive charts and other tools. And let me tell you in the beginning, that was a challenge for me because I felt it was a very American-like intervention. But families uh, have so many challenges, are so overwhelmed in so many ways that they need, they need routines, they need clarity. And um, uh, it's been, it, it, it really turned me around the way I thought about cultural adaptation by parents themselves. They love the discipline strategies. They love the incentive strategies like this one. I was not close to my children. I would only yell at them, do this, do that. I learned here that one thing is respect and another fear, they were afraid of me. Uh, but then we go to the culture specific components uh, like this. I would learn, I would like to learn how to talk to my children about racism because in many occasions my children have suffered racism just because they have Hispanic accents that they have experienced racism. That's why in our interventions, critical race theory and other theories have been important because he said, how do you prepare your children to live in a society uh, that is racially stratified that goes all the way to, to the slavery that we have experienced. And you know, we are in the midst of that battle here in this state. 
Um, uh, but uh, for us has been a no brainer since we developed those interventions because they need to train their kids to how to live in a society that is racially stratified in which they will most likely experience discrimination. So as a result of that work, the National Institute on Drug Abuse um, was very supportive of extending our work to families with um, uh, adolescent children. And that's the, the second study that we got funded, the first one by NIDA. And we implemented this with 79 families. It was a very small study because it was at the outset of the Trump administration. We realized that there were a number of conceptual challenges. We did not want to uh, overpromise what we were able to do. But despite that very adverse immigration context, uh, we achieved a retention of 87% of families, unfortunately. Uh, half of that uh, attrition that we experienced were because uh, was because the families were deported, but overall there was high satisfaction with the interventions and and the and the efficacy results. We just published those, and parents experience um, very marked improvements on parenting practices and youth adjustment. And rather than going over those, because the, the results are very similar to the ones that I mentioned to you in terms of the parenting and the youth component, I would like to zoom in the issue of discrimination again. And um, the narratives were different at that time. Uh, and we, we, we were able to collect new testimonies that we had never collected before. Like this mother talking about, my son was bullied by classmates at school because I'm an immigrant. It got to the point of him saying that he wanted to die. We suffer by being immigrants, but our ch ch children suffer even more. When we talk about this, my son tells me, mom, I know you came here to offer us a better future. So this is very important because this was at the outset of the Trump administration. And uh, you, know, you would see the videos in schools, build the wall, build the wall, build the wall. Well, this was uh, reported by one of the adolescents in one of those schools. And, uh, build the wall, build the wall, and it was not only that, that uh, Latino immigrant children were discriminated against. So here we are delivering this parenting program in, in the midst of a very tumultuous time, and we had never documented data in which a child would like to die because of the discrimination he suffered. Our children have lived all their lives here and we want to educate them like we were raised. We live in two cultures and we need to find a way to keep both cultures as we raise our kids. So it's not only the issue of discrimination that we had to address in an intervention as we were given the parenting components, but also the issue of bicultural challenges. Parents wanted to keep speaking Spanish, wanted to adhere to their Latino values, and adolescents, they wanted to um, adhere more to the US American values and traditions. And that's a bicultural clash. And empirical research tells us that if that bicultural gap leads to family conflict, that's a very critical predictor of adolescent drug use and other risk behaviors because uh, youth basically feel alienated. So we learn, we learn a lot about the importance of continuing to maintain adhering to the core components of evidence-based parenting interventions because those are the ones that make the difference in, the, in, the, in parenting outcomes, in youth ad adolescent outcomes. But also we learn the importance to overtly address issues of racism, discrimination and oppression to make sure that we got to the core of experiences that families were living. And we start to see new themes, we, new things that we had never seen in our studies, like this 14 year old who expressed, after talking with my daughter about immigration, she told me, uh, her daughter was 14 years of age. Mom, I'm going to be a social worker when I grow up. There are too many injustices against Latinos in this country. I want to help. Sorry about that, that uh, missing T. Uh, and and um, this is important because it, it breaks your heart to know that an adolescent is already thinking about these issues, but at the same time, it's mixed data, right? It's a mixed reality because it tells you that this adolescent is already thinking about ways of being proactive. So uh, right now we're funded by NIDA on, an, on a continuation of that grant that I, meant, I just presented to you. And in this current grant, we, it's a hybrid study in which we now are uh, figuring out the way to reach sustainability in large scale in mid Texas. And um, in a future opportunity, I will present you findings from that. It's going very well, but we're figuring out so many things, how to deliver online. 
and, and it's having great success. Our intervention delivery team is rooted it's, uh, in Mexico City, and we're implementing everything with families in Texas because it's a completely online intervention. And um, we are very excited because we are now that we have learned quite a bit about adaptation, we're integrating now that with implementation science. And we are very, very excited about the future direction and our future studies will be in actually, uh, they will be multi-state trials rather than one state trials because we're uh, reaching, we're discovering that we can reach so much with online approaches. I would like to close in the final minutes with the ways in which our US-based work can have very important implications for the world. And I don't wanna come across as presumptions about this, but the reality is that in the United States, we have access to tremendous resources. Just the funding of NIH provides with so many opportunities that our colleagues in Latin America do not have. Now, our colleagues in Latin America, they have such a passion, heart, desire, and thrive to make a difference that when we unite forces, we can achieve great things. So I would like to honor our collaborations in Mexico City with the National Institute of Psychiatry, the leading institution on mental health interventions. And basically they were able to take uh, from the lessons that we learned in our US-based study and take it to the next level. And I just want to show you the image of this uh, randomized controlled trial that they implemented because, you know, we felt that we had done a great job with a three-arm design. Well, look at them. This is a randomized controlled trial to evaluate the efficacy of PMTO adapted for Mexico with four arms, which is completely impressive. So I will not go into the details of this. I, this uh, slide is just to honor my Mexican colleagues, but they have really relied on key pieces from us to move forward, like us figuring out research design issues, measurement issues, data analysis issues, they take all that and make it into something beautiful. And this is the type of beautiful uh, transformation that they are able to achieve. However, as a result of working in Latin American context for uh, 15 years now, um, we have experienced uh, tremendous challenges. And one of those has been uh, the instability, the instability of governments, the history of corruption, Governments that take, come into power and they prioritize their political agendas rather than public health perspectives. So every time we feel we're gaining amazing traction, we always experience this. We experience something um, making us stop. And an example of that is the work we did in the state of Chihuahua, that's where I'm originally from. In the process of becoming an immigrant, immigration authorities asked me to relocate to Mexico for 18 years. So I relocated to Chihuahua with the hopes of implementing a large scale program of parenting prevention research. But this was the reality that I was experienced. This was in the late 2000s. And, and at that time, President Calderon declared the open war on the drug cartels. And you would be driving around and you see the upper right um, uh, picture and, and, and you would see the shootings coming across you and, and you would be with your kids and you would just hear the detonations of bullets. That's the reality that the country lived for many years and continues to live in many of the communities that are dominated by the cartels. So we ended up completely shifting gears. We didn't do the research, quote unquote, but what we did was to join forces with them. And what you see here is uh, the first uh, PhD class of the, uh, the first program in family therapy in the country, the first PhD program in the country. And what you see here, all these are master's level clinicians who specialize in trauma. All of these families have provided clinical services to survivors of abductions, to survivors of uh, violent death by the cartels, uh, by cartel violence. All these people have seen those realities and look at their faces. It just inspired me so much because they are full with uh, hope and satisfaction of offering um, their clients and families and new future. And we have been able to offer that through, um, you know, uh, sharing the beauties of parenting interventions. Now, those are the challenging stories, but when, when, when you look at this, hope really shines up and it's amazing. And now currently we are in a nationwide dissemination in Chile and we are over the moon about this experience. We have the opportunity to work with the San Carlos de Maipo Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization in Chile 
that they have really embraced um, the cause for uh, promoting evidence-based intervention. So we continue to do cultural adaptation research with them, but they have adapted at least five interventions now, Familias Unidas, uh, PMTO and others for the country of Chile. And we are engaged in dissemination of these interventions. And what is making the whole difference is that now we have a, a key actor from civil society, a foundation has, has the financial researchers, but also the commitment to science and social justice in a way that we have not seen before in Latin America. So our efforts are grounded in a key member of civil society that despite the situation in governments, they keep moving on. We had a great time about three years in which just the pilot study involved uh, 400 families. So it was really beautiful example of that. And then there was a change in government and the funding by government is in a question right now, but the foundation keeps moving. The people that they have hired, the people that they have trained, the, the community they are impacting, they continue to impact because they are privately funded. Not at the same extent and, and, and speed that we would if we had a stronger uh, collaboration with government, but that continues to be negotiated. But what I just want to communicate here is that a knowledge generated in the United States that could have stayed just in the United States, our colleagues are truly taking it to the next level. So I, I always want to come uh, to this perspective because it's like what we do here has implications for the world. And that's very important for us to take on, on that challenge. And as you can see, it's a combination of actors there, Fundación San Carlos de Marco, the government, Generation PMTO, and we come as middle person coordinating those efforts. So I would like to stop here. I would like to thank you all for your time. Uh, I know we are living very difficult times. Uh, the COVID pandemic uh, is here to stay with us and being transformed into an endemic and with everything that that represents. I was telling my colleagues that now the challenge is gonna be making sure that we continue to provide services to those populations that continue to be uh, um, affected by the pandemic and that we are at high risk of overlooking one of our community leaders um, uh, is not leaving her house. She's very afraid of getting infected despite of being vaccinated because you know of we have very different perspectives here in Texas in terms of the pandemic in some counties you see mandatory face mask and all there and others is like um, that face mask requirement disappeared months ago so um I I just want to bring us to the light that comes from when we connect with the best in us and the best in our communities we work when we are truly honor uh the strengths of the families and communities we work with and just an invitation to all of you um, that uh, it's very inspiring to see the work that you do day by day. And also to think about ways in which that work can be expanded in communities, um, underserved communities, communities of color that uh, have not been reached, but not only here in the United States, but abroad. So with that, uh, with that I would like to close. And once again, I would like to thank you for your time and I want to make sure we have time for question and answers and clarify any issues that may have not been clear. And once again, thank you for the opportunity to be with you here today. Thank you so, so much. I am so grateful for so many things, uh, some of which you and I had a chance to talk about before your session today. But one of the most powerful and impactful components, I think, of your session is just the very clear demonstration of the impact of making space to talk about oppression, discrimination, and racism as part of our clinical care delivery. I mean, the outcome data that you presented, I think is, is really compelling evidence to support that. And I'm thrilled that you have demonstrated that and that you've secured more funding to continue to do the same. Um, I, I think it reflects a really vital um, source of evidence for something that many of us know to be true, but to see the data, I think is, it speaks to different kinds of people to be able to support the research that will then beget more exploration and study. So I, I just am really impressed with it. It does lead me to a question that I have for you. Um, as I'd shared with you, you know, the attendees that we have today, some of them are predominantly researchers, but many, many of us are clinicians primarily or clinician educators. And when we think about the impact of your findings, but particularly in terms of um, the elements of hope, 
uh, making space for talking about real things, particularly about discrimination, oppression, and racism. I'm curious if you have thoughts for all of us who are more clinically active as opposed to researchers about what might be the, the top recommendations for things that we should be doing now. You know, many of us have not had adequate training and cultural adaptations of the evidence-based interventions that we have. Some of us have, so I, I wonder if you have particular recommendations for the clinicians and clinical educators in our audience about where to begin. Absolutely, that's a big question, a very important question, but thank you so much, uh, it's, a, it's extremely important. The first one would be um, the lessons with learning cultural adaptation. In cultural adaptation, when I started cultural adaptation, my Latino colleagues were like, why are you doing cultural adaptation? You wanna be white? <laughs> so I had to differentiate from them, right? But then my Euro-American colleagues said, why are you doing cultural adaptation? You're gonna dilute the effects of intervention. So I really had, going Bowen, I really had to differentiate from my friends, and I really had to, Latino friends, and had to differentiate from my Euro-American colleagues and come to the middle and say, what's the essence of cultural adaptation? And I think the first thing is, as clinicians, the essence of cultural adaptation is that we understand that for behavioral phenomena in the world across humans, for example, parenting, there are core components of parenting that meta-analysis um, meta research already indicate to us that are very constant across cultures and ethnic groups. The need uh, for effective communication, the need to give good directions, which is at the core of conflict. Our first role play is how do you give your kid a good directions? And we role play over and over because the beauty of parents and research was that they were able in microcoding demonstrate how that ineffective interaction can lead to hitting of children if there's an escalation process. Mm -hmm. So we start very, very small steps. So we stopped talking so much about insights about parenting and all that. So we got very behavioral on that. But as we go on the behavioral side, how do we adapt all the behavioral interventions according to context and culture, mm -hmm. right? Because if we are delivering an intervention in a community where we have shootings and we say, oh, uh, give an extra price to your kid and spend an hour extra at the park, well, that can be dangerous. And that's where we start to integrate context and culture. So is to embrace the challenge it, in our case, that's what we have learned of adhering to core components of evidence-based intervention we know work well, but also adhering to the life experiences of families according to context of culture that we need to adapt. So uh, we have a phrase is uh, 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 be flexible in adaptation, but don't let it go. That means that be very flexible in the way we deliver the core components of every intervention. And this can apply to any type of intervention that you can think of, family therapy intervention, CBT, uh, uh, trauma interventions. So be very flexible in the way you adapt it, but don't let go that core component that established the efficacy. And that has been a major contribution I think we have been offered is that adherence and fidelity to evidence-based intervention is essential, but in a way that culture and context informs that uh, adherence mm -hmm. and fidelity. The other piece is to think beyond our therapy rooms. And that has been essential. We have become advocates for our families. So uh, we have two cases of deportation that we were able to collaborate with attorneys and stop. And actually those cases become cases of refugees. And, and when they went to trial, immigration trial, the, the attorney helped us to put together uh, 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 a narrative in which we demonstrated that if that parent were to be deported, that US citizen child would not have a immediate family member in the United States with exposure to evidence-based training on parenting practices. Mm -hmm. So when we put together that narrative and we actually work with attorneys in the court, immigration courts and all that, we, we made the case that this kid needs these parents to know have this parenting knowledge uh, because otherwise uh, we are gonna do harm to uh, US citizen children. So those cases were filed on the grounds of harm to your citizen children mm -hmm. and and they the the partition proceedings stopped we uh, i i haven't still received an arrow one and it was going to be great but when i got the letter that those families uh, were here to stay and that they moved to a permanent residence procedure it was it, 
the biggest uh, joy I have ever experienced. But I think as clinicians, we are so well trained in our interventions, in our clinical models inside the therapy room, but not outside of it. So we need to become very active advocates for our families in external context. We need to go to the courts and advocate for the families we're working with and providing testimony. Mm -hmm. We need to go to the schools. If a parent is not engaging in the parenting program, what's happening? Well, that parent is not having enough to eat. Oh, then we need to provide social work services for that family mm -hmm. so they can have a better job. So the social work component the advocacy component, and, and thank you for that question because I didn't go through that in much detail. Mm -hmm. Every family that comes into intervention is uh, paired with a social worker that does a, a needs assessment. Mm -hmm. and, and then we work with that um, social worker to, to address those needs. Some needs are very uh, much easier to address like referral to food stamps or other services. In other, we need to become very active like he's advocating for families in immigration court. So I think our identities as clinicians needs to be expanded from delivering an intervention in, in a way it can be in the vacuum of the therapy room to deliver an intervention in a multi-layer context of adversity that families exist. If we don't do that, the impact, I'm afraid, will be very limited. And I think the long-term impacts we've seen is because we have um, addressed that in the intervention, but also at the advocacy level. Absolutely. I mean, you're really talking about some of the essential elements of community partnership and, and sort of stepping outside of our own expertise to listen for the order of operations and what people really need, in addition to the evidence-based interventions, whether it's around parenting or externalizing behavior or depression or anxiety. And so I, your point is extraordinarily well taken and clearly is on many of our minds as things that, uh, that need to be integrated into our treatment. And there are some people in our department who I think are actively working on looking at how to integrate those, but we could benefit from doing more. Um, there's a question here that I think is an interesting one to follow this part of the discussion, which is that we don't among us have very diverse clinical staff. And uh, the curiosity is whether your findings address who may be best positioned to deliver some of these interventions, particularly when they incorporate cultural adaptation. Mm. I think ethnic matching definitely helps in the initial phases right because you have increased trust etc uh but i would not say it is a requisite for becoming a very compassionate very effective clinician with diverse populations and for diverse populations to really be grateful for that mm -hmm. so in our in our trials we do a lot of ethnic matching because we're in community settings etc but i collaborate with a lot of clinicians in clinical settings and yes in the beginning there's a, a, a period of distrust and period of testing period of okay, do you really get what it's like to be discriminated against? Because you have never been discriminated on the basis of race because you are white and Latino. But I, I think with compassion and care and by clinicians putting those differences on the table mm -hmm. and by being overt about it, rather than not talking about it, by talking about it, um, those, those differences can be um, definitely overcome. And at the end of the day, uh, it's like when I provided life supervision, right? And they are early um, clinicians in training. They are so preoccupied about how they're going to look competent in the room and all that. And I said, you know, many of the worries you have, families are not thinking about. They are here because they are in angst. They're worried about a, a, a challenge they have, uh, an adolescent that seems to be out of control. So uh, that's something I say back to my colleagues who are non-ethnic minority scholars and, and are so committed to working with diverse populations, is just put on the table the differences. Uh, say, yes, I see we're different. I see that I have the privilege. I always say when I start a parenting group, I'm a Latino, but there's no way um, I'm experiencing the same you're experiencing. I'm in a privileged academic institution. I have layers of privilege that you don't have. So I put everything that out there on the table. But then where is it that we can coincide? And I would say just by by talking about the issues, putting them on the table, and then focus on the on the common interests and goals, which at the end of the day, in our case, is that parents want to give the very best to their children. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, the next question that we have is, um, what do you think about the roles of Latinx cultural values in the setting of the United States? 
children have to do the same schooling and other work like uh, other children from other ethnic minorities in the U.S., but their parents hold cultural values from their immigrant countries. So it, it's a question about roles and values for those particular families in the midst of navigating a system that is surrounded by lots of other values. You know, the research on biculturalism is very vast and very um, fascinating. The initial trials indicated to us that the immigration, the bicultural gap between uh, Latino uh, parents born outside the United States and U.S. born youth, they show us that whenever there was a gap, there was a potential for conflict. And if there was conflict, there was increased risk for drug use. But then that research started to expand to other states like California with different configurations of Latino immigrants. And that bicultural gap, what they found is that the bicultural gap does not necessarily lead to family conflict. It all depends on how that gap is perceived by family members. But then there were other examples in California which were quite fascinating, not as prevalent as the others that the ones who would acculturate faster were the parents and the ones who wanted to be more Latino were the US born kids. So you had a reverse bicultural gap there, right? And a conflict of that because parents would say, you should not learn Spanish. You should not do that because you're not gonna dance. And the kids were like, but that's who I am. I go to school and all my, my classmates here in LA speak Spanish. So what I would say is what is more important is the attention to process. Mm -hmm process and recognize that the, the bicultural gap is going to be there and that the potential for that gap to leading to conflict is high, but mm -hmm. also to intimacy is high as long as the gap is recognized and multiple perspectives are recognized in value. So rather than one direction or another, the bicultural gap research has told us that it's real, but that the ways in which it takes shape and can be resolved are multiple so in our interventions we don't say do this do that we say this is the gap this is what can happen with the gap some families go this direction some families go this direction you have to figure out which direction you gotta go but what we can tell you the importance is that everyone's values and experiences are valued and recognized and when you you will have to give up a little bit of yourself if you're a latino parent and you see struggling with some of your kids preferences but vice versa and, and that's, that's the key that we have learned and that research continues to demonstrate uh, can have an impact on, the, on, the, on, the, on, on that gap. So to recognize it, but that the process is promoting multiple acceptance, validation and recognition of contrasting Latino uh, values and, and, and the ability of family to hold on to those differences is what we have learned is the most important thing. Wow. I mean, spoken like a true systems thinker, which I appreciate, but also as a systems researcher, and I, I think reminds all of us that making room for multiple perspectives is really a, a pathway for healing and recovery and stability and, and positive relationships. I just am so grateful for your time today, and thank you to our audience for the questions. Thank you for your gracious responses. Um, again, the link to the evaluation form is in the chat, and for those of you uh, who won't be able to get to it today, it will show up in your email tomorrow. Um, and again, thank you so much for spending the time with us, and I wish everybody a good afternoon. Thank you so much. It's been an honor. So wonderful. Remember all those times in graduate school and look at us now sharing this space. <laughs> and thank you again for your wonderful community of clinicians, faculty, service provider. And thank you again for devoting that time for, for, for us today. Thank you so much. See you soon. See you soon. Bye bye.